It's Friday, December 16th, and COVID's not taking a holiday break. We start here. With respiratory infections accelerating, more cities are once again urging residents to wear masks. The problem, of course, is, you know, how often are people going to do it? We'll go over what disease experts are seeing. Lawmakers are also worried about viral videos. This company should be banned. I don't know why they're allowed to operate in the United States. How far could a TikTok ban go? And at this point, they're just box office royalty. Everything that I knew wasn't true and that the palace knew wasn't true and internally they knew wasn't true that was just being allowed to fester. So why have Harry and Meghan created such a stir back in Britain? From ABC News, this is Start Here. I'm Brad Milkey. We're entering the last weekend before Christmas and Hanukkah, which means everyone who's not in your immediate family is inviting you to their shindig this weekend. Your office, your neighbors, your friend who seems to own way too many ugly sweaters and always wants to show them off. And yet, in an increasing number of cities, officials are outright telling residents you should not be partying, at least not without a mask. The city's health commissioner issuing an advisory, urging people to mask up indoors and for crowded outdoor activities. I don't see too many people wearing a mask. You can count, you know, like with a finger or your hands, how many people? We're a year out from the surge that led to the highest amount of infection in the shortest amount of time. So I'm going to start the day with one of the doctors who was warning about the Omicron surge, who was warning about the effects of COVID early on, and has really spent the last several weeks urging health officials to act more boldly. Dr. Eric Feigel-Ding is an epidemiologist, health economist, and he's chief of the COVID task force at the New England Complex Systems Institute. Dr. Feigel-Ding, thanks for being here. I mean, can you just sort of help us understand where are we at and what is causing these cities to sort of up their alarm bells ahead of the holidays? Yeah, thanks for having me. Well, I think cities uh, across the U.S. vary by how, you know, aggressive they are, as we know. New York City is seeing the fastest surge of cases. They're not just high transmission, but they're all uh, they're also at high community levels and wastewater surging also in New York City. So New York City is recommending basically masking in all public areas, indoors and actually in, in some outdoor areas, they're recommending it as well. But basically all uh, indoor gatherings and public transit. It's a recommendation, it's not a mandate. And Los Angeles is also doing this uh, similar recommendation for public uh, gatherings. And I think when they're recommending it, they're recommending it for offices, uh, restaurants, schools. The, the problem, of course, is, you know, how often are people going to do it? Right. And especially, you know, private parties. Um, it's, it's a guideline. It's not a mandate. But are people going to heed it? Uh, because masking is only one element of the total strategy to mitigate against COVID. There's also testing, which the White House has just announced um, free testing um, kits mailed to every address in America. Right, uh, they're doing another one of those rollouts, right? Four, yeah. four tests per household. Right. But um, so you should also test before you do any gathering. Uh, and of course, insurance uh, also reimburses that. Uh, it's been reimbursed for a while. But also, I, I would think the best thing, because people don't want to wear masks when they're with their friends, uh, especially in their own house parties, ventilation, hmm. of, you know, uh, in, in public health, something we say is the solution to pollution is dilution. <laughs> or in, in the case of this virus, dilution is ventilation. And That's like the hardest thing to repeat at the holiday party, though. I know, I know. At the end of the day, it's just opening of windows and right. doors create a draft. Or if you have high-tech uh, gadgets, um, have a whole bunch of HEPA filters uh, if you have a large gathering. I know not every home is able to do this or afford it, but, you know, ventilation, air disinfection are key hallmarks in addition to testing and, and masks. Obviously, if you go out on public transit, you should probably wear a mask. And I always tell people, elevators, uh, actually, you don't see people in elevators sometimes. You're sometimes riding alone. But elevators are actually some of the highest transmission risk because that you don't have much air and it's very crowded and lots of people come through it. So try to wear masks and elevators whenever possible too. Hey, and by the way, you you went straight to COVID. Is this mostly about COVID, these recommendations, or does it include flu and, and RSV and all these all of these viruses? Or right. is COVID really the thing at this point to you? No, it's, it's a triple-demic. And I say COVID because 
we have good data on COVID. We don't have good data on RSV and flu. Mm. We, we know flu is surging nationwide. Like we don't have systematic testing. We don't have home mailed home RSV or, or flu tests that you can just do pop in your home usually. Mm. There are some that you can buy, but they're expensive, right? And, and this is where I, I tell people, it's it, all these respiratory things share similar transmission properties. They're mostly airborne. Um, obviously, you know, hand washing is important, but these are mostly airborne. If you're respiratory, they're mostly airborne, and COVID is especially airborne. And so you should assume that the droplets stay in the air for quite a, quite a while. And the only way to get rid of them is either air disinfection or ventilation with a draft. Um, the, the RSV is really affecting kids a lot. Um, and also we're not vaccinating against flu enough. We don't have a vaccine against RSV ready yet. So, uh, and of course, getting the vaccine booster against COVID is important, but a lot of people just aren't doing it. But I really urge people to at least get the bivalent booster from your local pharmacy. It, it is so critical, but I know a lot of people, a lot of people don't want to hear about wearing masks, but then get boosted. Well, if you're not boosting, if you're not having masks, and I know there, there are people out there like this, then please, with the love of God, please open a window. Buy HEPA filters for your home. Just do something. Get, try to do at least two out of the three, mm. right? Or two or three out of the four, if you include also testing. But do some mitigation. It, it will really make a difference in slowing the spread and protecting your of friends, families, and neighbors, especially around the holidays when there are a lot of gatherings. Yeah, and one of the, re- like, my, my local CDC advisory right now says, Brooklyn says all five boroughs of New York are high risk, which means everyone there should be wearing masks indoors in public settings. That's the CDC recommendation. I didn't even know that till a few days ago because it's really not publicized as much as it used to be. And a big part of these guidelines that the CDC changed last year was how many hospital beds are available wherever you are. That number has changed dramatically because of all these RSV and flu cases, making everything sort of that much riskier. Dr. Eric Feigelding, really helpful. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you so much. Next up on Start Here, should you get ready to pack up that ring cam for good? What lawmakers are prepared to do about TikTok after the break? This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. After an extraordinary newsmaking year, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. And here's to everything ahead. The world famous Chippendale. You would have never thought Chippendales would be surrounded with murder. The contrast between the fun, campy performance and behind the scenes, it's literally murderous. Let me tell you the part you don't know. Success can go murderously wrong. It's really explosive. It's raining. 2020, tonight at 9, 8 central on ABC. Pop quiz, real quick. How many of these viral TikTok trends do you know? My money don't jiggle, jiggle. It folds. I like to see you wiggle, wiggle. For sure. I made you look. Yeah, I look good in my Versace dress. It's cold. I need you to stay. 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 
are lots of people who don't use TikTok or who still inexplicably don't know how to download the video app onto their phones. Parents, by the way, it's an app. They all download the same. Your kids do not have to explain this to you. Sorry, got carried away there for a second. Obviously, this gets personal for me. But there's a growing number of people, though, in this country who are not allowed to download TikTok because they've been told specifically by their boss this is not safe for our company or for our government. And this week, the U.S. Senate unanimously agreed that TikTok should be banned on federal government devices. ABC's Elizabeth Schulze covers tech and business. Elizabeth, I know TikTok is owned by, like, a Chinese parent company, but what is the problem with having it on American phones? Look, the issue here, Brad, lawmakers say, is that TikTok is owned by a Chinese company called ByteDance. And basically, because it's owned by that Chinese company, there are concerns that the Chinese government could get access to the personal data of the millions of Americans who use TikTok every single day. It's honestly hard to imagine, Brad, that any bill would pass in the Senate with unanimous support, but this bill on a TikTok ban has passed twice. This is an effort supported by Missouri Republican Senator Josh Hawley. As the father of two small children uh, who already have many of their friends on social media, even though they're quite young, I find this absolutely horrifying. Who basically wants to outlaw the use of TikTok on government devices because of these concerns about data. It collects your keystrokes. It collects your location data and maybe lots, lots more. And I can concerns tell that the Chinese government could get access to the data, especially when it comes to federally owned devices. So this bill essentially would mean that anyone who works for a federal agency couldn't download or use TikTok on their government-issued phone. The idea of entrusting that much ability to shape content and engage in influence operations, that much access to people's devices. And, and as you point out, this is really gaining momentum at the state level, too. A lot of states have also passed laws trying to restrict the use of TikTok on government devices, too. Is the issue that I heard you say, like, personal data, is the issue that China would know, like, what kind of cereal I'm into? Or, like, is there concern that Chinese intelligence would, like, be listening in on my phone's microphone? Like, how, how, how big are the concerns? Right. So I think the th important part to remember here is that personal data, user data, really is currency for a lot of these digital companies. You know, TikTok has more than 100 million users in the U.S. So the concern that top government officials, including the FBI, by the way, have raised is that the Chinese government could collect that data, possibly use it for intelligence purposes, so for spying purposes. When you start getting a look at what China could do with the information, they could do things potentially like, you know, use it to further target people for hacks. But also try to target users with disinformation, potentially try to sway them on their views about the Chinese government. Mm. And so there's this, this concern that by getting access to that data, you know, the, the Chinese government could influence some of those users without them even knowing it. Oh, like, you don't have to spy on them. If you know somebody likes dance videos now, you can just, like, start serving them up dance videos that are pro-China, or you start serving them up, like, whatever the content is you know they like, and kind of tint that info. Exactly, and users might not even recognize that. And, you know, I think it's important when we're talking about this, Brad, to remember that the relationship between business and government in China is very different than it is here. And so all of these things are in the hands of uh, of a government that doesn't share our values uh, and that uh, has a mission that is very much at odds with with what's in the best interest of the United States. There actually are laws in China that can force companies to hand over user information to the government in ways that might not be the case in the U.S. You know, we've seen this play out with other major tech companies. If you think about Huawei, this was a company that was in the news a couple years ago. It's a telecommunications equipment provider. Basically, several countries ended up banning that equipment because they were worried that Huawei would have to hand over data to the Chinese government. This could be sensitive data about calls made between people, you know, sensitive data about communications between individuals or businesses. And, and the reality is that the Chinese government could get access to that. And what they do with that is, is its own question. Now, obviously, TikTok is denying that the Chinese government would get access to its data. It says that all of the U.S. users' data is stored in the U.S., that this isn't something that the company is doing. But this really has been kind of an ongoing saga that we've been hearing about. There's been these drawn-out talks between the government and TikTok to try to come to some resolution about these data concerns, and, and so far that really just hasn't happened. It, so if it's not on a few thousand government phones, fine. If it's not on, like, Virginia lawmakers' phones, fine. Their videos are boring anyway, usually. <laughs> is there a chance, though, that this app would be banned for everyone else? Like, is there a chance that the U.S. government would go further and literally say, you're— 
Americans can't have this anymore. There's a chance, Brad. I mean, remember, wow. former President Trump, at the end of his term, actually threatened to ban TikTok for everyone in the U.S. He said unless TikTok was sold to an American company, people here shouldn't be able to use it. This company should be banned. I don't know why they're allowed to operate in the United States. And in Congress, we're seeing a similar effort right now. Senator Marco Rubio has just introduced legislation for a national ban. I want to ban TikTok for a very simple reason. They allow the Chinese Communist Party to gain access to all of the private data on any device in America that's using TikTok. Basically saying that the risks of the Chinese government getting access to TikTok user data are just too high. And this, this should be something that we're passing on a wider scale. Now, unclear if there's actual appetite for that in Congress. I think there's a lot of users who probably even are listening to this who say, I don't have appetite for that from my point of view, they like using TikTok. This is a right. really, really popular app. I kind of treat it like any other social media app. Mm-hmm. Like, there's no reason to be more scared of it being on my phone than like Facebook or Instagram. There are some companies who would be pretty happy to welcome that news. Notably, if you think about Meta, the parent company of Facebook or Snap. Oh, like Instagram's been trying to become TikTok. So if TikTok goes away, <laughs> that's great for Insta. Totally. It's worth noting that when Senator Rubio introduced that legislation, those stocks actually went up because it wow. would be good for them if TikTok was banned. But, I, you know, there's a there's a little bit of a disconnect there as far as what the government might be pushing for and what the users want. And and that's something that still needs to be worked out. Unclear if there would be kind of that momentum for a a bigger ban that would really affect kind of the whole of the American population. It was unanimous agreement to the Senate about the government devices. The House would still have to weigh in on that, but not necessarily the same kind of consensus about whether regular folks should be able to use this app. All right, Elizabeth Schulze, thanks so much. Thanks so much, Brad. If you've been on Netflix in recent days, you've probably seen there's a new documentary out about Prince Harry, who's since given up his official royal title, and Meghan Markle. Everything that's happened to us was always going to happen to us, because if you speak truth to power, that's how they respond. Yesterday, the final three episodes of this docuseries were released, and it's predictably caused a stir in the seemingly limitless world of the British royals. And yet, while this is meant to be effectively an advertisement for Harry and Meghan, it's also created a backlash in much of Britain and even parts of the U.S. I think it's outrageous, and it's a publicity stunt. I, I'm sorry, I just see it as a, as a way of ca- grabbing some cash at the expense of your family. Let's go to ABC's James Longman, who's based in London. James, I've not watched a single moment of this authorized documentary, because authorized documentaries are usually boring. They're authorized. But it, it does sound like there's a ton of drama here. What have I missed? Well, Brad, it is very much their side of the story. So you're not going to get any kind of self-reflection on the part of Meghan and Harry. There's there's not going to be much introspection about what they did or didn't do that, that may have contributed to them leaving. The couple just want to get their version of events out there. Everything that I knew wasn't true and that the palace knew wasn't true and internally they knew wasn't true that was just being allowed to fester. So there was no other option at this point. I said, we need to get out of here. This is a whole string of allegations about what the royal family did to them and what the press, specifically the tabloid press, uh, how they hounded them out of Britain. The first morning that we woke up in our new home is when I miscarried. I believe... My wife suffered a miscarriage because of what the mail did. I watched the whole thing. The tabloid press in Britain specifically can be awful, and I think you do really get a kind of a close-up personal sense of how that affected Meghan specifically. You are making people want to kill me. It's not just a tabloid. It's not just some story. You are making me scared. The main allegation, though, that they make, and Harry makes specifically uh, in this latest three episodes, is that other members of the royal family, and by other members, read William and Kate, are jealous of Harry Mm. and Meghan. And for that reason, uh, they started planting negative stories about them in the press. The issue is when someone who's marrying in, who should be a a supporting act, is then stealing the limelight or is doing the job better than the person who was born to do this. That upsets people, it shifts the balance. Harry says it all started when they were on their Australia tour, which was, by the way, a tour that I was on. And, you know, we were all enthralled to Harry and Meghan. I mean, they were rock stars on that tour and all the press was pretty much uniformly very positive about them. Putting aside what I think about her, right? She's becoming a royal rock star. Bigger, I would argue, as a couple than William and Kate. 
That's probably not a good thing in the long term. And what Harry says is, Kate and William couldn't take this and started getting jealous and so planted these stories. Because you've been led to believe that the only way that your charities can succeed and the only way that your reputation can be grown or improved is if you're on the front page, front pages of those newspapers. And now we've ended up at the situation we're in. That, that made what were the Fab Four split into two couples and from then on it was war. Well, but for all that, like, a lot of that is about vibes and, like, interpersonal relationships, et cetera, et cetera, which I can understand if somebody's, like, not for me. But the biggest headline from this whole fallout that has affected the larger monarchy is about the race of Meghan Markle, right? This inner, like, this question of is Buckingham Palace, are the people there racist? Because that can very much have a practical effect on a country. The bro- The older brother of Harry is going to be the next king of England. Have we learned anything new, like substantiating what Harry and Meghan had claimed to, like, Oprah? We have not, is the short answer. And I think what, what upsets a lot of people in this country is that the, the, the suggestion of racism is there without giving tangible proof or, you know, outlining exactly what might have gone on. The, the kind of suggestion and the kind of hinting at it continues throughout all six episodes. Not that specific members of the royal family are racist, but it's a racist institution built on racism because because the British Empire was a kind of, uh, you know, a large uh, racist ent- enterprise, which it was. Um, but I think it's it's in six episodes, it's very difficult to properly examine the history of British co- colonialism. And I think a lot of British people might say that there are some slightly lazy comparisons made in that regard. Um, what you can't deny is that tabloid headlines about Meghan were racist and that the the royal family chose to do nothing about those things uh, really, really upset both Harry and Meghan. And it was just a clash of cultures where, you know, you have an American who feels very motivated to speak up and speak her mind versus a British institution which doesn't usually do that at all. What's been the reaction am- among the British public there? Well... <sighs> Look, they are very... Po- <laughs> you know that Americans are all like, hey, Meghan Markle has been done dirty. That's why you just took that inhale, didn't you? That's absolutely right. I mean, look, I think uh, some of it does realise all the worst fears that Brits have about Americans. in The idea that, you know, someone is, quote, finding their truth and all these kind of phrases that British people shudder at. But this is the fundamental difference between Brits and Americans that Meghan herself found. She found at times, I think, a royal family who were frozen in time and their emotions were frozen. And when she needed them, they couldn't be there for her because Mm. it just wasn't in their DNA. So I think in both the public setting and the private setting, she found interaction with members of the royal family difficult because that particular family, and I know families like this, Brad, they don't do emotion. Well, I don't think it means anything at all for the monarchy because they're 6,000 miles away. So I think it was so, on so many levels, it was just a disconnect. Um, but there's really nothing anyone could have done about that. I think he should add more respect. More respect for his family. And if you're going to go, go quietly. But you can bet your bottom dollar that the royal family are not going to say anything about this. Uh, they feel that keep quiet, carry on. And, you know, Harry's got a book coming out. It's going to come out early next year. And I think we're going to just see a real effort by Kate and Will especially to, to kind of put out the business as usual uh, image. Oh, fascinating moments here. All right, I'm, I'm, I'm hooked now. Fine, James, you got me. <laughs> uh, James Longman, there, there in London. Thank you so much. Thanks, Brad. And one last thing. If you're in the upper Midwest, you don't need me to tell you. Winter storms are making their way across the country. So, that's my car. Residents have been tromping through more than a foot of snow in parts of Nebraska, Wisconsin, the Dakotas. Duluth, Minnesota got 27 inches. Which means it's time for residents there to welcome the snowplow known as Scoop Dog. Earlier this year, the Minnesota Department of Transportation held a contest to name each of its big snow plows that clear local streets. The most popular choice was Betty Whiteout, which is now stationed near Mankato, Minnesota, followed by the big Laplowski and Control Salt Delete. And this little ceremony of naming snow plows has been gaining traction in recent years. 
that's perhaps most famous in Scotland, where big gritters are heralded for spreading grit or salt across the road. At some point, little kids started treating gritter drivers like Santa Claus. In fact, just like NORAD's Santa Tracker, you can locate Scotland's gritters in real time. Years ago, they started giving them names like Gritty Gritty Bang Bang, Gritney Spears, and Spready Mercury. Well, as the pandemic began, more and more U.S. cities were running low on funds. They wanted to create some kind of goodwill with residents. So one by one, you saw them start to engage online. Over the last couple winters, one of their biggest successes has been snowplow names. You answer the call, Hilliard. The city received close to 100 entries. In Vermont, elementary schools get the right to name local plows. My favorite this year is Snow Be Gone Kenobi. But the finest submission of them all came from the Ohio Turnpike Commission. After a flurry of last-minute votes, one of the vehicles smoothing out roads this winter will be named Plow Chicka Plow Wow. They literally just go down lists like this for days. Jennifer Snowpez, William Scrapespear, Clara Pathra. Just have to stop the show now. I will keep doing this for the rest of the day. Start Here is produced by Kelly Therese, Jen Newman, Brenda Salinas Baker, Madeline Wood, Fika Aronson, Iru Ekpanobi, Cameron Chertavian, and Tara Gimbel. Ariel Chester is our social media producer. Josh Cohan is director of podcast programming. I'm our managing editor. Liz Alessi is the head of ABC Audio. Thanks to Lakia Brown, John Newman, and our intern, Nania McLean. Special thanks this week to Victoria Mole Ramirez, Katie Kindelin, Faith Bernstein, Kirat Radia, and Peter Gwynn. I'm Brad Milky. See you next week. you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. 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 That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby! It was crazy. Behind the Table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. So much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. Been a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news. Free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. ABC News, America's number one.